Hello, I'm Doug White, and welcome to NBC10 Biographies. In this episode, we will meet two extraordinary individuals. One fought for the rights of the common man, the other turned our world of theater upside down. Adrian Hall ignored angry critics and public outrage while creating one of the most respected theaters in America. Thomas Dorr fought against laws that restricted voting rights. His crusade began with speeches and ended with armed rebellion. We begin this edition of NBC 10 Biographies with Adrian Hall. Thanks to the energetic direction and giftedness of Adrian Hall. I thought he was mad. You know, I thought he was a total uh, a madman. I didn't know how right I was uh, initially. Every piece was a personal statement to him, a personal comment. He was one of the founders of a new American theater. Adrian Hall was born in 1927, the only son of a scrappy cattle rancher and a mother who dreamed her boy might become a preacher. A small Texas town bearing the hardship of the Great Depression set the stage for the childhood of this sensitive young man. Often the target of schoolyard bullies, his talent in local plays won him the respect of his classmates. A little country school we had over there, uh, school pretty often put on little plays, you know, and of course he was always the best. <laughs> After graduating from high school, Paul enrolled in California's Pasadena Playhouse. This is the Pasadena Playhouse, a nationally known landmark in the world of the theater. Who will be the stars of tomorrow? Only time will tell. And only hard work can develop the gift of talent. Upon graduation, Paul looked forward to a life in the theater, but events halfway around the world would dramatically change his future. United Nations forces drive ahead toward the Manchurian border and the power dams of Northern Korea, which the communists have been fighting desperately to defend. In 1950, Adrian Hall was called to active duty in Korea. Notifying the draft board of his sexual orientation would keep him out of the war. His friends urged him to do so. Just declare that you're gay, that there's no, uh, you know, and that the, the army won't take you and so forth. But uh, uh, all of my family had been in the army. My father had been uh, wounded in the war. My, my brother-in-law has purple heart. An accident on the rifle range damaged an eardrum and eliminated Hall from combat duty. He was transferred to Germany and ordered to put his talents to work entertaining the troops. Hall quickly organized the 7th Army Repertory Company. His creativity and ability to improvise foreshadowed a unique and colorful career. Returning to civilian life, Hall pursued his craft, first as an actor, later as a director. He joined New York City's off-Broadway movement. A growing reputation led to his big break, a chance to direct on Broadway. But the deal fell through and the angry young director turned his back forever on the Great White Way. Fate dealt its next card. Hall was offered the job of artistic director for a fledgling theater in Providence, Rhode Island. He accepted and made his bid to change the world of theater. We knew that there was going to be an American theater and we all were going to be part of it. NBC 10 Biographies will return in a moment. Why don't we, when we come down in the thing, tie the thing off here? For the next 25 years, Paul would make Trinity Repertory Theater his home. No actor who ever worked with him can forget the experience. I just thought he was perhaps the most bizarre person I had ever met. I had only been in the theater for a couple of years, and, and uh, he just had an energy that was different from anyone else's energy. I can remember him sitting in the back saying, do it, uh, the, the, the darling. <laughs> <laughs> do it for me. I'm out here, not just for you, not just you talking to another little actor standing next to you, but all those other people that came. In 1966, Trinity received a grant that would allow thousands of school children to experience professional theater. Project Discovery became both a blessing and a curse. 
Serious theater productions collided head-on with the impatience of bored and hostile teenagers. The students were just bored to tears. They were way the hell. They could barely see the actors. They were like little, and so they would throw quarters, and these nickels and dimes would be bouncing off the walls, and so the walls would be waving back and forth, and, and the actors would be ducking and like trying to keep them from being hit, and you know, and the students would be c casually taking out their pen knives or their box cutters and ripping up the seats, and you know, and 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 it was disastrous. The experience forced Hall to rethink his approach to theater. No longer would the audience be allowed to passively observe a play. The first breakthrough was a play called Brother to Dragons. Hall needed to convey the horror of a slave being brutally murdered. A black actor was suspended upside down. The audience held its breath. Someone came rushing on with this great big old butcher block table and I came on with this horse's leg. What happened next changed the history of theater. Bill Kane suddenly had an axe in his hand and came down into that uh, piece of meat, which was real, and pieces of fat and bone and sp would split, split her out and everything. It was devastating. The ability to confront an audience with images and action that shook their souls became Hall's trademark. You could hate it, but you didn't leave bored and you didn't leave without an opinion and you talked about it for days, and you wanted to run us out of town and fire him and all of those wonderful things <laughs> that, uh, that he, he, he was very brave. But not everyone was thrilled with Hall's daring style of theater, a style he was willing to defend with a ferocity often found in those possessed by genius. He would uh, uh, call up and just uh, take off into arias of, of uh, protest and indignation and annoyance and uh, invective. While the first to admit that not all of his innovations were successful, Hall followed a natural instinct for reaching his audience that seldom led him astray. This was a guy who uh, really wanted that emotional center to be true and true to what his vision of it was. And once he had found out what his vision of what that emotional center was, he was a pit bull. He would not let that go. In 1970, Adrian Hall staged a play about cult leader Charles Manson. The production took place while Manson was on trial for murder, and Trinity was launching a fundraising drive. The community was shocked, and the board of directors was not amused. We formed that big circle on the stage and got the audience to join hands. We joined hands with them and did this chant, we are all one, we are all one, that own kind of chanting. And they did, they participated, and at the end of it was the line, me, you, and Charlie. And people were just, they had joined the group. Somebody jumped up in the back of the theater and said, you crazy, what the hell do you think you're doing? They were screaming and yelling. But we got them to, to go along with us. In 1976, Hall's battles with the board of directors reached a climax. Infuriated by controversial productions that made fundraising an endless headache, they attempted to fire him, but the actors rallied around their leader and announced they would not return to work if Hall was dismissed. Adrian remained. The board members resigned. He would continue to work his magic at Trinity for years to come. And he used me and stretched me and took me to places that I never dreamed I would go and never be given the chance to go until he was brave enough and insightful enough to see the humanity in all of us. His art was about finding ways of, of making a confrontation in you that made you look at what he was showing you. And once you allowed yourself to go with it, you were nine times out of ten overwhelmed by the beauty of it. I used to watch him sometimes, and, and, and uh, he, was, he was part therapist, part confessor, part butt kicker. Jesus, God, he looks like Lord Fauntleroy. He doesn't look like a kid working in a factory. Adrian Hall's commitment to the theater can best be illustrated by an incident that took place in 1979. Trinity's financial situation was so bad that he had to pledge his own house as collateral to the Internal Revenue Service. It was a bold move, but an IRS auditor warned Hall of the possible consequences for both of them. It was necessary for him to... Uh, you know, look me right in the eye and say to me, Adrian, 
I will take your house and your car and everything that you own, including your clothes, if we don't straighten this out. And then he waited a few minutes and he said, my wife will leave me if I do that because she loves Trinity, but I'll do it, he said. You know. In 1981, news broke that Trinity would receive a special Tony Award for Best Repertory Theater in America. To present the Regional Theater Award, here is Meryl Streep. This national recognition was well-earned and brought pride to patrons of the theater and citizens of the state. But it put Adrian Hall, the man behind Trinity's success, in an awkward position. But suddenly to be awarded um, something from the, from the commercial world that I had actually turned my back on and had actually spoken out against on numbers of occasions, uh, uh, you know, I felt a little sheepish and a little silly about it. The Tony Awards Administration Committee has voted a special Tony Award for the most successful regional theater of the year. A faulty teleprompter, missed cues, and the pressure of a live broadcast resulted in an acceptance speech that was passionate, convoluted, and pure Adrian Hall. Seventeen years ago, we began with a vague dream that it might be possible in the, in the American theater to, to live a good and, and productive life in the framework of a permanent ensemble. Without the continued support of the National Endowment for the Arts, without the, the continuing dream of actors who understand the, the uh, idea of a, a, a life... Um... I thought it was uncomfortable just uh, with the whole situation, the formality of the whole thing, and they rushed. I mean, they, they, they were so busy saying, you only have two seconds to do this and two seconds to do that. And, and, and he's very careful with not taking up people's time because he recognizes the importance of time. And I think he just felt terrible pressure to get on and get off. And most of all, without the guts, the courage, and the talent of the entire ensemble at Trinity Rep, I would not be standing here to say, like the little red train about to mount the highest mountain, I think we can, I think we can, I think we can. Thank you. In the fall of the same year, another honor was bestowed on Trinity. A State Department sponsored tour of India, Syria, and Egypt was announced. During their travels in India, Adrian Hall spoke passionately about his belief that actors deserve the respect of any enlightened society. I've said this before, but I, I say it again and again. I, it, it's never been so clear to me as it has been in India that the, um, you can't imagine a doctor working part-time at another job during the day so that he can practice his craft at night. You can't imagine somebody in medicine. You can't imagine somebody in science. You can't imagine anybody in religion doing that. And so, um, if, if anything, we have become um, um, a kind of uh, politicians for the right of the artist to exist in the world and for the right of the artist to be able to make his livelihood in his craft. In the mid-80s, Hall began splitting his time between Trinity and the Dallas Theater Center. He completed the transition in 1989. Occasional visits to Providence release a flood of affection and respect for this pioneer of modern American theater. First of all, Adrian Hall is the cultural icon in Rhode Island. He put Rhode Island on the national map as no one has before or since. Adrian is the least pretentious great artist I've ever met. He believes in doing exciting things that grab an audience by the collar and make them understand that art and storytelling are their lives. It's visceral and uh, audience embracing. Trinity Theater continues to flourish, and the role Adrian Hall played in building the foundation for this remarkable institution still receives high praise. He created a theater where it was understood that the heart of the theater was the work of the artists who made up the theater. He created a home for artists. Adrian Hall's vision, his courage, and his commitment to the art of theater continues to challenge and inspire us. The story of Thomas Dore, next on NBC 10 Biographies. The 
right to vote, the cornerstone of democracy. Fighting for the opportunity to exercise that right has often been a difficult struggle, even in the United States. Rhode Island's colonial charter limited voting rights to men who owned land. It was a restriction that remained in effect even after America won her independence from Great Britain. As the country became increasingly industrialized, waves of immigrants arrived to work in factories. These new citizens, many of them coming from Ireland in the early 1800s, could not afford to buy land. But they soon demanded their right to vote, despite strong opposition from established Yankee landowners. Well, they were afraid <coughs> that uh... The Irish uh, Catholics, uh, if they became uh, voters, uh, would uh, take their directives from their bishops and ultimately from Rome. Because of land ownership requirements, power was unevenly distributed in state government. Portsmouth, with a population of 400, had just as many representatives in the General Assembly as 3,000 residents in the city of Providence. Into the political storm stepped Thomas Wilson Dorr. The son of a wealthy and well-established family, he led the fight for reform. Frustrated in their attempts to gain power through traditional means, the reformers held their own convention. They drafted a people's constitution that extended voting rights to male citizens without property. It was a major step forward on the road to true democracy. But unfortunately, the state's black population was left out. He was in favor of blacks voting, but the white ethnics, uh, mainly the Irish, that he was kind of the ring leader of, they said, eh, us first, and then we'll talk about them. Dorr had argued on behalf of black voters, but failed to sway the convention. There is no evidence that the right of women to vote was even considered. Oh, I think he would have been shouted down as resoundly as he was for uh, championing the uh, votes for the African-American community. I mean, you have to understand, this is a uh, period in time in which um, folks are very concerned and very anxious. There's a lot of tension about who is an American, who is uh, part of the, the corporate body that makes the laws and um, helps us shape our community. Dorr was elected the people's governor, placing him on a collision course with then governor Samuel King. Tensions between Dorr's followers and the so-called law and order party began to escalate. Editor Henry Bowen Anthony of the Providence Journal published articles that fanned the flames of bigotry. Foreigners remain foreign, he wrote, and are still embraced by Mother Church. He bows down to her rituals, worships the host, and craves absolution from the priest. He cannot be assimilated. It was very clear that the Irish Catholic menace uh, was paramount in the minds of many individuals who opposed the extension of the suffrage, who opposed the people's constitution, and who condemned Dorr for leading this reform movement. The crisis came to a head in May of 1842 when Dorr and his followers attempted to seize the state arsenal. Their cannon misfired and the attack dissolved into chaos. Dorr's rebellion quickly became the object of fear and ridicule. Governor King sent his law and order army in pursuit of Dorr and his followers. The people's governor escaped, but his idealistic dream was effectively crushed. Governor King declared Dora a traitor and offered a reward of $5,000 for his capture. Thomas Wilson Dorr returned to Rhode Island in the fall of 1843. He was swiftly arrested, tried, convicted of treason, and sentenced to life in prison. Supporters immediately began to demonstrate for his release. Dorr was eventually granted amnesty, but his health and spirit were broken. He died at the age of 49. The ideals that Dorr fought for would one day become the law of the land. And experts agree that Dorr's rebellion deserves a significant place in history. I've always been really disappointed that the Dorr rebellion wasn't 
more fully integrated into American history. This was a revolution. The elites were busy keeping the working classes down, and the working classes rose up with Thomas Dore as their leader, with an elite as their leader, saying, hey, this is America. We have a right, and we have rights. Many of the reforms that were put forward have eventually become law. So Dore and his equal rights movement have been vindicated by time and experience. I think it's the most important event in Rhode Island history. NBC 10 Biographies will return in a moment. Thank you for being with us. I'm Doug White, and be sure to join us next time for another edition of NBC 10 Biographies.